All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I apologize. I woke up in the middle of the night with a scratchy throat, and now I'm going to be talking for a very long time with a scratchy throat. So if I pause to drink water or get a cough drop, that's what's happening over here on my end. Um, but as mentioned, I'm Heather Howard. I am an associate professor and the director of undergraduate education at the Purdue Libraries and School of Information Studies. So we are not a an LIS program like what you are in, we are the libraries, but then we also do have uh, curriculum as well. So what I'm going to be talking about today, um, first some context for my university and my library here in the US. Uh, then I'm going to be talking about the curriculum um, that we've developed, and then also sustainability and scalability. Uh, I think a, an issue with libraries all over the world is that there's not enough librarians. So how do we reach the students? How do we get you know, uh, the students at these very large in institutions to all understand information literacy when there's only a few of us? Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the, the strategies that we have used here. Um, I apologize. I'm doing this from my house. So, of course, my cats have decided to start fighting much like any other time I do a meeting at my house. So I apologize if you hear that. Um, so first off, I'm going to talk about the context here at Purdue University. So something interesting in the United States that you may not have heard of is our land grant system of schools. And I'm not going to go too deeply into this but it does impact our mission in libraries and why we make some choices that we make. So there are, I'm not even sure how many, I think 114 land grant schools, and these came in three different waves. Purdue University is one of the original land grant schools from the 1862 Morrell Act. What that did was give land in the different states for public institutions of higher education. Um, and there's some continued federal support for that, too. So the mission of land grant universities is to extend access to higher education to the working classes. So there were a few things going on in the 1860s when this this happened in the U.S. One, we were just we had just gotten out of our own civil war. Uh, two, our institutions of higher education were basing themselves on places like Oxford and Cambridge. So we had. Harvard and Yale and places like that among our first schools, they were not public institutions and they were really primarily for the wealthy and the elite. So part of the idea of the land grant school is to educate everyone, right? And that is still one of the main missions to, to educate the general public. Um, and this was in practical fields like agriculture and engineering. So at these land grant schools, you will often see really large engineering programs, really large agriculture programs, very practical things, large science programs, uh, and we are no exception. Our two, our, our biggest school here is engineering. We're, we're known for that. Uh, we also have a very large agriculture school. Um, one of the additional funding opportunities through being a land-grant school is we can have extension offices to support public agriculture. Um, so Indiana has, I believe, 92 different counties and in every single county, we Purdue University has an office for extension, is what it's called. And they support the public in those counties, particularly in the field of agriculture. So there's a lot of support for farms and farmers, um, even gardening. We run a master gardening program that's available in all of these areas. Uh, so there's a lot of support in that. What impacts me is we're supposed to co contribute to economic development. Uh, I am among my other titles, a business librarian. So when I'm not doing my administrative work, I'm primarily working with business students, entrepreneurs. Uh, so this part piece of the land grant mission does impact what I do. And it allows me um, with, within the realm of the, the promotion and tenure system that my job sits in uh, to still work with members of the community. So um, supporting women entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in the community in general, things like that I've been able to do partially because we are a land grant school. Uh, and then the main areas that we focus on are learning discovery engagement to solve practical problems. Um, so through openness, accessibility and service to people. So we are not just serving the students at our school. Ideally, we're serving the entire state that we are in. 
So where are we? I am in Indiana, um, one of our 50 states. We in, in the Midwestern United States, if you're familiar with where the Great Lakes are, Chicago, we're about two hours south of Chicago uh, here in West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, again, we're a public research institution. We were founded in 1869. We have about 55,000 students. Um, I will talk more about that later, but when I started here eight years ago, that number was about 40,000. So that's created some challenges, that level of growth. Uh, we have about 200 different undergraduate programs and 80 different graduate programs. We are also known as the cradle of astronauts. Um, so both the first and most recent people to walk on the moon came from Purdue. Um, we have 27 astronauts overall, uh, a very large aerospace engineering program here. Um, and in the libraries, it also means we have um, a, a space and aeronautics uh, archive. So we have, for example, um, Neil Armstrong and Gus Grissom's papers, their archives. So that's a fun thing too. So librarians in the Purdue context, uh, we are academics. So we are tenure track, we have around 40 faculty, uh, and again, we'll talk more about that 40 faculty to 55,000 students uh, and what that means for us. Uh, we work on a liaison model, which I'll talk a bit more about as well. Um, and we also offer unique curricula under the ILS heading. And this is something that's rather unusual in libraries in the US. Um, we became a school in 2017 or 2018. Before that, we were just Purdue libraries. We had a provost who really recognized the teaching that we were already doing, and he changed our name um, with our input, of course, uh, to the Purdue Libraries and School of Information Studies. Um, a fun aside, since this is a, an LIS uh, audience, changing your name in an academic environment can be really complicated. Um, a, a, a logical name that many, many people in the libraries thought we should be is the School of Information Science. But there's politics involved. And we, one, we are not an LIS program in the same way that you are. We don't have a graduate school. And two, the word science uh, on our campus feels, th there are other, other areas that feel a lot of ownership about it. Um, and they think that infor you know, information science means informatics, and there's other people on campus who are doing that work. So we are information studies, um, which has also worked out, I think, to our advantage. Uh, I have a colleague who likened what we do here to environmental studies. So environmental science and environmental studies. With environmental science, you're really looking at the hard science pieces of things, right? And environmental studies, you're looking at more of the social social and cultural aspects of that science. And that's really what we're doing here. Um, so that's a little bit of context about where I am situated physically and within this, this realm of academia. So we have these 55,000 students. What information skills do they need? so that we can we, we need to know this so we can figure out what exactly we're teaching them. Of course, we all have what we learned in library school, you know, the basics of information literacy, but there is a big, well, one, information has changed dramatically, right? We have AI, we're in a very different realm of mis, dis, and mal information than we were when I was graduating from library school. Um, our political landscape in the US in terms of information looks very different. Um, so we need, we need and our students need different things now than they did 10, 20 years ago. So we have both done and, uh, and, and dug into research on this. So here on our campus, we've done a few different studies. Um, these, these are in APA order, not chronological, and that's not what I should have done. Um, pardon me. So the first study on here, if we're going chronologically, is Jeffries and Lafferty. And this is one that we've looked at a lot. Um, they were in Minnesota and they did surveys of students who had co-ops and internships. And they asked those students, what information tasks and resources did you use in those co-ops and internships? Uh, and also what challenges did you face? So that's some information that we looked at. Uh, we also, redid that study, but with business students at our school. We also have a very large business business program. So we did that. 
Um, and we also looked again at in, in several different ways at how students and graduates are using information in the workplace because it is very different than how they're often asked to use information in academia, right? It's a lot more complicated, a lot more specialized. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that and what we found um, coming up as well. But, um, you know, in the workplace, we, we have human pieces, human sources of information, and we don't often talk about that in academia, right? We don't tell people to go out and consult an expert or ask someone else where on the server the piece of information they need is, but that's often how we're finding information on the job. Um, so some interesting things we found out there, and we use this information that we found um, to help us develop our curriculum in a few different ways. Um, so now I'm going to talk about our curriculum uh, and what we've done. So at Purdue Libraries, we have been teaching courses long before we became a school. Um, I, I started here in 2016, and I was teaching um, that course at the top, Management 110, as well as Management 175, and those are housed within our business school here. So we still had librarians as instructors of record, but the courses were not under the ILS heading. That is new as of when we became a school. Um, but we were embedded in other, other programs. Um, so ILS 70, 175, Information Strategies for Hospitality and Tourism Management, that's also a course that I taught, but prior to becoming a school, it was GS, General Studies 175. Um, but we were already teaching courses. Uh, that in itself is a bit unusual. Um, but when we became a school, we really had to then start developing real curriculum, not just teaching courses here and there and other programs. We had to figure out why we're teaching, what we're teaching, what the strategy is behind it. Uh, and for a while, it just felt like people were teaching courses they were interested in or where they could find a niche in another program, which is great. We can reach a lot of people that way, but there was no real strategy behind what we were doing. So we've we've started working on that. Um, I think we're, we're much further than we were, but we're still working on it. So where this started uh, coming into a sort of defined curricula rather than just these individual courses we were teaching in other areas uh, was with our certificates. <laughs> So we started doing these um, and we do partner with other schools for these, but we do run all except one of these out of libraries. So we have a graduate certificate in digital humanities, a graduate certificate in geospatial information science or GIS. Uh, and then we have an undergraduate, undergraduate certificate in digital humanities as well. And that's the one that we don't we don't manage, it's managed out of the College of Liberal Arts, but we are a partner on it and we teach the core courses for it. Uh, and then we are currently working right now on a museum and archives certificate that we're developing with Purdue Galleries and the College of Liberal Arts. Um, our archivists are also faculty members uh, and as an academic, you really have to be teaching uh, in order to tell that promotion and tenure story. So we're trying to, figure out the best way for our archivists to be teaching while also giving them time to deal with their actual practical archival work, right? Processing collections, all of that, um, working with researchers, all of the things everybody does in archives. I am not an archivist, but they do a lot. So we started solidifying a little bit of a curriculum in these certificates, but most of us were still teaching general courses that were kind of housed here and there. We had, During this time, a lot of people would create courses based around their interests and their expertise, and then no one would sign up to take it, right? Because you're creating an ILS course and the students all across campus, they need to take courses that are on their plan of study in order to get their degree. And many of these plans of study are very full. So if a course doesn't help them get their degree or their minor or any other credential that they're working for, even if they're interested in the course, they're likely not going to take it. Um, so we spent a lot of time, unfortunately, creating courses that no one would take. And after dealing with that, we, we came to the conclusion that we really needed an information studies minor. 
Um, and we also had to find out if that was even a thing we could do, right? We don't have a major, we're not a library school. Um, and in, because we're also, some, some of the more intricate things of our government, we are, as well as being a le federal land grant school, locally, we are a public state school. So we get money from the state. Um, and there are a handful of other state schools within Indiana. And the state does not want to give money for duplicate programs. So Indiana University has a library school. Right, uh, and they have several campuses on which they offer these programs. We will never, likely, never get a major because any major has to be approved by the state, and that would then be a redundant program, and they they don't often do that. So um, we can't have a major. So can we have a minor without a major? So we had to find that out. Turns out, yes, we could. So we formed uh, a minor planning committee, uh, which I was on, and. If I'm not sure if you have minors in the same way that we do, um, but they are, well, I'll, I'll get more into it and you'll see, but it's it's kind of a smaller spe 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 specialization uh, that you can take along with your major degree program uh, to really broaden what you can do when you come out of school. So for example, I did my undergraduate at Purdue. I have a bachelor's degree in organizational leadership but I have a minor in computer programming technology, right? So I came out with these, these two different credentials, uh, but a minor is not nearly as many credits as a major. So this is the team of people that I worked with. Um, you're not meeting them today, so I'm not gonna go into it, but I did wanna give them, give them some credit. This was our, our main team, but we did have support and involvement from every faculty member in the libraries. We did not just create this in a vacuum. So the very first thing we did as we were building this curriculum was identify the stakeholders. So who has a, a, an, a vested interest in what we are doing as we create this curriculum? Uh, so one, all, all the other colleges on campus. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One, they have to approve the minor, right? It goes through a committee made up of associate deans from all of the colleges and they have to approve it. So we need buy-in from those people so they vote yes for our program. But two, because we don't have our own degree granting program in libraries, we need their students, right? We don't have our own pool of students from which we can draw to get students into this minor. I need students from the sciences, from liberal arts, from the humanities to come and take my classes. And if we don't have buy-in from their colleges, they're not going to encourage their students to do our program. So that's, that was a big one. That's why that's at the top. Uh, second, we have our library faculty and staff. We needed buy-in from the people who were doing this thing, right? Uh, it can't just be our little group. It has to be really all 40 of us need to be involved and supportive of what we're doing. Uh, these are the people I'm going to be asking to teach our courses who will be doing outreach to students to try and get them to sign up for our curricula, right? Um, so we need we need buy-in from them. I need, I need them to create new courses to fill in gaps as we learn more about what our students need. Um, so we did a lot of work there. Library administration, of course. Uh, if our dean isn't interested in doing this, then we are all wasting our time. Um, thankfully, she was very, very supportive. Um, same with the associate deans. We really needed their support as well. Uh, university administration, we all report through a dean who reports through the provost office. And there is an a, a vice provost for teaching and learning. And if she is not on board, then we're not gonna get very far with this either. Um, the students, of course, they're stakeholders. And then employers, the folks who are hiring our students after they get these credentials. So after we did that, after we identified all of our stakeholders, we started doing research. Um, we did an environmental scan and document analysis. So we went and dug through any school in the US who was doing something like this. And we did find a few who had minors, none that were exactly like what we were doing. We looked through the types of courses that libraries were teaching um, and really just got an idea of what this environment looks like outside of library schools. 
Um, Because again, that's not what we're doing. We're teaching at an undergraduate level. Um, And I should also mention in the US, we don't tend to have undergraduate library degrees uh, because in order to get most jobs here, you need a master's degree from an American Library Association accredited institution. So it's there's not a lot of curricula for undergraduates. And what we're teaching also is not library science, right? It's information studies, which is different, which makes it um, kind of unique. We've not found another program doing exactly what we're doing here. But that was part of what we wanted to see, what's everybody else doing? So that was step one. Uh, Step two, we did student focus groups. Before we put a lot of work into this, we needed to know if students would even be interested in taking these courses, right? Um, What do they want? What what would be interesting to them? Would would they think that what we were considering would be valuable to them? Um, So we did student focus groups. And then also, again, that library faculty involvement. We did a lot of library faculty focus groups focus groups and interviews to make sure everyone was involved and everyone was being heard in the process. Um, And then university to workplace. uh, I'll talk, I'm going to be talking a bit more about that project, but again, that was some of the research where we were um, talking to employers. So we specifically interviewed a group of employers who hire extensively from Purdue uh, to find out how are how new hires from Purdue were doing with information tasks and challenges, um, what they were doing well, what they were struggling with, and, and what were they being asked to do and to use in terms of information. So we were able to take what we learned from that and adjust our curricula appropriately to try and better prepare our students for being on the job once they graduate. So student outreach, our focus groups, um, we didn't do an IRB for this because we're not, this was not to be published research, this was to inform our work. So I can't give you the exact results of our focus group, um, but I can tell you we did four of these with undergraduates from all different disciplines. I think we ended up getting somebody from every college on our campus. Uh, And there was near universal interest in an information studies as a value add to degrees. When we talk to them about what we do, what we could help them with, it they, they got it, um, which we were really excited about. They could see how this could help set them apart, how it could really help them both, both in going into a career, but also if they wanted to go into graduate school, the skills that they would learn in our program, they, they really understood how it would help them. So we were very excited about that. It was very encouraging. Um, And there was interest among students in courses that we teach both in our own department and then also those courses that we were already teaching in other departments. Um, They really liked that it's evidence-based curriculum, um, information as a resource for students navigating the information landscape, and then students, again, from both the STEM side of things, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math, and then the humanities and social sciences, were excited about this opportunity. Um, they thought, all of them thought that it would help improve what they were doing. So that was really excited because we, exciting because we really didn't know when we started doing that if the students would get it, and they did. So the other thing we had to do is talk to all of the other colleges at Purdue. Um, myself and our, at the time, our associate dean for learning, we had meetings with the associate deans for learning from every one of these colleges. Um, We needed, again, their support. We wanted to get their ideas on how to recruit their students. We wanted to explain to them exactly what we were doing. Uh, And we also wanted their vote, right? So this this was a big deal. And that's why we took the time to have individual meetings with all of these people. Um, It was very time consuming to do that, but it really has uh, paid off dividends for us. It's been very positive. Um, These people in these schools who maybe didn't understand what libraries or even information literacy, information studies, they didn't necessarily understand these things, right? The language is a, is a real barrier, I think, when we talk talk outside of libraries, right? We know what information literacy is, but employers don't. People in other departments don't necessarily know what it is. But it gave us the opportunity 
to show them what we were thinking, to show them the courses that we were considering for the minor, the learning outcomes that we had developed, right? Here's what we want the students to know when they're done with this. And everyone was so excited. I had more, I, I had a lot of these people tell me they wish they could make every one of their students take our classes. Uh, so that was really encouraging because this is not necessarily uh, the reaction we get as libraries a lot of times talking about what we could teach. So that was very exciting for us that they were all on board as well. Um, I should also note I'm peppering in some pictures of our campus in here. So that is uh, our big mall. Um, this is not, this is not one of our library's faculty. I couldn't find a good picture. This one's a stock image, um, but we did meet with library's faculty. We really wanted them to be involved in the process. We had a lot of faculty meetings that were planning meetings, right? Where we would, we would talk about what our expertise is, what students need to know, how can we make these things align? Uh, we got curriculum input throughout. So when we would put together a draft of what we wanted this to look like, we would send it out for feedback to everyone, or we would have a meeting where we would all talk about it. Uh, and then we also asked for uh, other people than the minor planning committee to actually create these courses. So we had teams of people, because we had, we had to create three foundational courses for the minor. Um, and we had teams of people work together to create a shell syllabus for each of or syllabi for each of these courses with learning outcomes, general topics covered. Basically, here's what this thing is without creating the whole course. Then we had different teams of people take that and create the course from the learning outcomes and basic topics. So we got involvement from many, many people in the development of these courses so that everyone felt buy-in to the process that we were doing. They felt ownership. Um, so we did that. We had many listening meetings. Um, we did have a few people who weren't sure about what we were doing, right? I mean, I was very gung-ho. I thought it was great, but that's just me, right? Other people thought we were moving too quickly. Um, they, were, they were nervous about it for various reasons. So we met with them individually to make sure that they felt heard and to make sure they were heard, right? In some cases, those meetings led to some changes that we made in the process because the points that these people brought up were very valid. Um, so th that was all very helpful to get input um, from my colleagues uh, and then support from the dean. Of course, we had to meet with her throughout, keep her updated on what we were doing. So some key takeaways from all of this information gathering that we did. Information studies can respond to current information landscape with flexible and capacious approaches, right? We are, we're very flexible. Uh, we provide a robust set of theoretical and practical skills for future careers in the information age. Uh, it offers an exciting new uh, offering at a university dedicated to innovation and technology. And it provides opportunities to deepen critical engagement with technology and information pertaining to culture, identity, and politics. So what did this curriculum that we built end up looking, looking like? So here is the description of the minor and some topics that we include. Um, so information impacts every aspect of the human experience from artificial intelligence to global information networks to misinformation and conspiracy theories. Purdue students across every profession, from science and engineering to business and liberal arts, will benefit from pursuing an information studies minor. This minor focuses on the ethical, societal, historical, and cultural importance of information, applications of tools and methods to analyze and visualize data, and how information is used in professional and academic contexts. So the topics that we cover in our courses, data ethics and privacy, that one specifically came out of interviews we had with employers. Um, we were finding out that undergraduate students, when they would graduate and go work on the job, had no idea how to keep information confidential. Um, it, privacy is not a thing that they're thinking about in their daily lives. And when they're on the job, they also are not thinking about it. So that is something we've embedded specifically because of this gap um, that employers reported to us. And this includes an accounting firm, a really large multinational accounting firm who hires students who then 
don't understand data privacy, right? Which is a big problem. Uh, so that's something we're trying to address. Miss, dis, and mal information and the politics of information. Um, I'm not sure how much you know about US politics, but it is it has been a mess um, for the last a while. It's been a mess for a while, but there have been really large mis- and disinformation campaigns that have really impacted our politics. So how do we how how do we equip our students to navigate that sort of world? Uh, online culture and social media, intellectual property, uh, informed research methods, data foundations, skills, and applications and the information implications of technological advancements. So here are actual learning outcomes. Um, what we want any student who completes the minor to be able to do. Um, we want them to be able to navigate the information environment to make evidence-based decisions in professional and academic contexts, examine the role of information in its ethical, societal, historical, and cultural context to address real world situations, determine the significance of information focused opportunities and challenges such as intellectual property, mis and disinformation, artificial intelligence, security, and privacy, apply various approaches to research using data, including techniques from data management, data science, digital humanities, and other methods, and reflect in an informed and critical manner on information infrastructures and practices. So you can see this is different than learning outcomes for an LIS program, right? It's more that information studies rather than information science slant to things. So again, looking more at how we as humans operate with this and are impacted by data and information rather than how do I run a Python script to analyze this data set, right? That's not what we're looking at. Um, although we do have a few courses that do involve Python and R, it's more how do you use those tools to, to do storytelling with, with your data and your information? How do you use it to make sense of what you have? So the actual curriculum, that we developed. Um, it's 15 credits and a standard course at our university is three credits. Um, they have to take one required course. Every student has to take ILS 100, Introduction to Information Studies. Um, and that course talks about um, really what we're doing, right? Uh, the, the foundation of all of those things that we're talking. And then also we go a little bit into what are some information careers that you might have. Um, and the other piece that I didn't talk about with this is we are involving our archivists as well. They're part of our they're part of our faculty. They're part of our team. So you, they'll learn alongside these other information sources, right? Like the ones that I deal with, like company reports, um, financial data, uh, government information. They'll also be using primary sources and learning about those as information sources as well. Uh, and then they can choose from one of our two other foundational courses. They can take information, culture, and society, and data foundations, tools, and applications. Um, they could take both if they wanted, but they're not required to. Um, one other fun thing we're doing with the ILS 300, Information, Culture, and Society, uh, I'm currently working with our new Associate Dean for Learning, and we're going to turn that into a study abroad course that will be taught in London. Um, to, to expose our students to a more global perspective of information uh, when we're thinking, thinking through that cultural and societal lens. And then they can take any of our courses. Um, we have this split up because the university has requirements for how many higher level courses have to be in a curricula. So they needed to take at least, uh, I believe six credits total that were above 300 level courses. So, they can take any of our ILS courses. And then you'll see on there, we also have those courses we were already teaching. So Management 110, Management 175, those are already taught by libraries faculty. So we wanted to count those in what we were doing. And it's also a recruitment opportunity um, to try and get students from those classes into our curriculum to take our other courses. 
Um, and, 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 and I already talked a bit about developing those foundational courses, uh, but we did have teams of people who were who were involved in those. Um, the other thing we're doing there, the all three foundational courses are being taught online. Um, not at, at not at a scheduled time. I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> this head cold is, is messing with me. Uh, I wanted to say asymmetrically, and that's not what I'm asynchronously. There we go. Uh, so these, they're being taught online asynchronously. The trick with recruiting students from all of these different colleges is that we can't possibly schedule our classes around when everyone has their core courses for their program. Um, it gets really tricky with scheduling even within a, within a department, let alone when you're trying to recruit from 200 departments, right? So we wanted to create a path through uh, that was entirely online. So several of our electives are taught as in-person courses. They're welcome to do that. Those management courses are taught in person. And as our program grows, we might end up offering uh, in-person sections of those three foundational courses as well. But for now, we're starting out uh, with, with online asynchronous. Uh, and the students that I've talked to seem to really appreciate that because they want to take other programs, other minors, and they just can't fit them in with how their classes are scheduled. So that's one, one other thing that we're really focusing on there. So our next steps with this, we need to finish building the ILS courses. ILS 100 is running this semester. Um, I should also note that we did get approval for the minor from that, uh, that council of associate deans. Everyone said yes, it was not a problem at all. Um, so we are up and running as of this fall semester. This is our very first fall semester. We do have students in our 100 level course and the development of 300 and 301 is being finished right now and we are running those in the spring semester. So working on that, the big thing we're doing right now is promoting the minor. So I am meeting with advisors in all of these different colleges. Um, I'm trying to be strategic because I am one person. Uh, and again, our school is very large. So looking at like basic, basing the, the conversations that I'm having around the information that I got from the meetings with those associate deans. So some of our students, for example, students in the College of Pharmacy, they don't have room for any additional classes at all. They can't take a minor, they can't do a certificate, their plan of study is packed from their first year to their senior year and there's just no room. So I would really be wasting my time if I went and I talked to those advisors. The business school students, however, have a lot of room for minors and certificates. So I've met with them directly and I'm trying to be strategic in that way. Um, also, we're meeting with incoming students. Uh, tomorrow morning, I will be on campus bright and early uh, to work an event for students and their parents who are considering Purdue and they want to learn more. So I will be there talking to potential Purdue students. Um, I worked a fair last week that students could go to to learn more about all of the different majors and minors and certificates available at Purdue because again it's very large and it's hard to know all of the things. So we talked to hundreds of students at that event. Um, we're running tabling events outside of our own libraries where we talk to students, really just doing everything we can to get the word out. Um, and then we also want to expand our course offerings to meet current information challenges and also to fit with our faculty expertise. So we've done some curriculum mapping, course mapping, to look at what we're teaching at the different levels. And one thing that came out of that is we really need some three and 400 level data courses, right? So we're working on that right now, figuring out who's going to teach them, who's going to develop them. Um, and then, of course, just changing as the information world changes, right? Not being stagnant, right? So we have folks working, of course, on AI. Everyone's working on AI and talking about AI right now. We're not neglecting it, just not me. <laughs> um, so we're, we're doing that as well. We need to keep it, even though it's brand new, the information landscape changes so quickly, we need to make sure that we're constantly adapting uh, to make sure our students are well prepared. And then, 
uh, advancing collaborative efforts with other colleges and initiatives at Purdue and then beyond. So. All right. So that's all I'm going to talk about for the minor for right now, because the minor is just one way that we are reaching undergraduate students. And we recognize that we can't, both it won't happen. And also we couldn't support it if all of those students, all the students came and took our minor. So how can we reach the rest of them? Um, so I'm gonna talk next about sustainability and scalability here in our libraries. Um, you know, I've mentioned several times, there's not a lot of us and there are a lot of everyone else. So what are we doing about it? How are we handling it? Um, and I should also note that in the US, this is not unique to Purdue. I've worked at several other institutions and there are never enough librarians, right? So this is a perpetual issue in higher education in the US. How do we reach everyone? Um, the exception are at, again, some of those elite schools. So. Harvard and Yale, for example, very well staffed, um, but these public institutions tend not to be, and most, most institutions tend not to be. So here in the US, we work primarily on a liaison model, and we do at Purdue as well. This has been the case at every library I have worked, on, worked at. So librarians are assigned liaison departments, typically based on subject, specialty, or expertise. So I mentioned that business is my area. So I have some departments within the business school that I am a liaison to, but then outside of the business school, um, I also support hospitality and tourism management. Um, there is some business in engineering. Um, I work with some senior design classes on marketing analysis and competitive intelligence. Um, and then we have a large entrepreneurship program that is not in the business school. So it might not, the liaison areas might not directly match colleges and departments, um, but they are, they do tend to be assigned based on some sort of expertise. So when you have a liaison area, the librarian provides teaching and research support to their assigned areas. Um, this could include research consultations, and that could be with students or faculty. Um, guest lectures in the US, we often call these one shots, but they're, it's just where you're going in for a day to teach much like I'm doing right now. Um, so we do a lot of guest lectures. We do embedded instruction, and that could be a bit more. That could be a series of guest lectures. It could be collaboration on assignments and grading. Um, uh, we do assignment consultations with faculty who want to work harder to embed information literacy in their courses so we can work with them to design a, an assignment um, that brings in elements of information literacy because that is our area of expertise. Um, and really the goal of this traditional liaison model is to provide research and information literacies to su support two departments when we have limited resources, right? Um, this is somewhat effective, but it has to be done really correctly. I have been invited to do a number of guest lectures that has low or no impact to the students, right? All of the research shows that if you are teaching information literacy in an undergraduate environment, the students will only really retain it if it's tied to something they're doing. Right, so project-based, assi uh, uh, assignment-based, um, something that they are hands-on using these skills for. I have been asked to just come in and do a tour of databases. Come in and tell me all about the marketing databases that you have so that the students can know. I say, well, what assignment are they doing with these? Oh, none, I just think they should know about them. So that is a waste of everyone's time. Um, I've also been asked to just do tours of the physical library. We don't really do that anymore, especially in business. The students, they might use the physical library for study space, but the, the resources that they need are all online, right? That's where the marketing databases are. That's where the company databases are. They're not in the physical library. So um, thinking about this model uh, and what how, how we, can, we can update it is something that we've been doing a lot of. And that also has to do with becoming a school and changing our curriculum. So some local context for how, how things are here. 
we have about 44,000 undergraduate students, 13,000 graduate students, 4,000 faculty and instructors, and 40 librarians. Um, so you can see the problem there. Uh, it's not just the students, it's all of the faculty members, right? How do we meet with and support all of these people when there are only 40 of us? Um, and of the large research institutions in the US, um, when, when I last looked, we had the fewest librarians. So it is, it's challenging everywhere and it is very challenging here. So how, how do we then do the best job that we can to support all of our students? Um, oh, and here's an example of our recent growth. Uh, in the last 10 years, we have grown just exponentially. So the business school alone uh, in 2016, I'm, I'm, I'm basing this on my start date. I got here in 2016. We had 2,533 undergraduate students in the business school and we had three business librarians so that was pretty reasonable even though and again because of how the liaison model looks it's not or works it's not just students in the business school who we support this doesn't count those hospitality and tourism management students it doesn't count the entrepreneurship students it doesn't count the areas in engineering that we work with right this is just looking at the schools um, because that's the data that i could pull so that wasn't so bad, but now in 2023, we have 4,145 undergraduate students. We did get one more business librarian, um, but then also my role is now 50% administrative. So that says four, but really it's three and a half. Um, and there is a huge investment in our business school right now. And I anticipate in two years, that number will be about 6,000. So I, and I don't anticipate we'll be getting any more business librarians. Uh, engineering is even worse. In 2016, we had 8,412 undergraduate students and six engineering librarians. And in 2023, we had 13,346 undergraduate students and still six engineering librarians. Um, so you can see the challenge uh, and we really need to think about how we can support these areas without being in every class and meeting with every teacher because it's just become impossible here. You just, you cannot do it. Um, and so there at other schools I've worked at, if we had a liaison area that didn't want to, they, they were hesitant to work with libraries or didn't see how the library would be valuable, we would spend time and resources trying to convince them uh, of of why their students really need libraries. Here we can't spend time doing that, right? Even with the people who want to work with libraries, that's already too many. So it creates a bit of a service crisis, right? How do we do this? So one way that we've done, uh, and I'm gonna talk about two, but I'm gonna spend most of the time on this first one. Um, one thing we've done is a project called University to Workplace Information Strategies. Uh, and that's that's the website right there. My chat isn't working or I would drop that in, but um, you can also just Google that title and you can find the website if you want. Um, this project started, um, again, because of these sustainability issues, but we've also found, uh, and it shouldn't be a surprise to any of you, uh, but evidence shows that academia does not currently do a great job of preparing students for the information needs of the workplace. So in academia, academia, it's often traditional sources of in information that are emphasized. So peer reviewed journal articles are the gold standard. Uh, students are often given assignments that have very defined beginnings, middles and ends, right? And involve very clear information sources. I need you to find three peer reviewed journal articles to make your argument in this assignment, right? The workplace though, um, I don't, I bet none of you who are out in the workplace have ever had a boss give you a job assignment and you had to support it with three peer reviewed articles, right? That's just not how the workplace is. So workplace information needs are messy and ill-defined. Um, they might be assigned to work on, you might be assigned to work on or take over in the middle of a project, right? You're not coming in at the beginning or coming in the middle. 
Uh, it could involve working with a lot of different team members other than your primary disciplinary area. Um, workplace needs require expanding your own information landscape beyond just the traditional sources that we've learned about to other pre-existing sources, um, but also could include gathering information from human sources, as I mentioned before. So this could be your colleagues, it could be your client, it could be your boss, right? Any number of human sources of information. Um, Evidence also shows that students struggle to remain interested in lessons that lack real world application. Um, they also struggle to retain material that doesn't uh, allow, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm repeating myself there, but real world applications. So they need to see the relevance in what we're teaching them. They need to see how it can apply to what they will be doing. Um, so I've been interested in this type of work for a long time. I work with business students and engineering students, and both of those populations really are concerned with um, hireability, right, and success on the job. So I was able to work with um, a really great team on this. I don't have a picture of them, but we, we received funding um, from an internal grant to develop this project. Um, in spring of 2022, Purdue called for internal funding under an initiative called the Innovation Hub. Um, they focus on funding course-based teaching and learning innovations at scale. Uh, and as I mentioned, scalability is a big issue here because we need to reach all of these students or as many as we can. Um, oh, and I do have a picture of my research team. Um, so these are, are my colleagues. You see I have two other librarians on the team. And then we also have Fred Berry, who's a professor of engineering technology. So he was not uh, a librarian, but he is a friend of libraries. And he has a lot of contacts in industry that were, were very helpful that I'll talk about uh, in just a moment. So we made a proposal for an innovation hub project focused on the academia to workplace information transition. And fortunately it was awarded. Um, there was also some cost share that our libraries gave as well. Um, they gave us some, some graphic design support uh, and things like that. So the key components of this project um, that we proposed, it's a series of foundational information focused modules centered around micro learning, which involves creating short, targeted learning experiences that are available at the point of need. Um, this approach has gained significant traction recently in corporate and industrial environments. They're doing this with a lot of their training. Uh, and then micro-credentials, also known as digital badges. These are a digital representation of a skill, a learning achievement, or a, an experience. So to develop our information-focused modules, we, re we relied upon our experience, but we also consulted the literature. Um, we developed and planned our initial learning outcomes and outlines for each module, and we drafted scripts. We then sought stakeholder feedback, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in just a moment. We recorded and edited our videos. And we finalized quiz questions for each module, uh, which we then also got stakeholder feedback on. And we created the quizzes in our learning management system. Um, so here at Purdue, we use Brightspace as our learning management system. I'm not sure if that one is very prevalent in Europe. I know Moodle is, um, and it's similar, similar to that. It's just a learning management system. So, Stakeholder consultants. Um, with our grant funding, we were able to hire five stakeholder consultants. Uh, we had two under, undergraduate students, uh, one from Purdue Polytechnic, which so our Polytechnic School, Technology School, one from business. Uh, we hired two employers from industry and then one entrepreneurship expert. Uh, this was exceptionally helpful because they were able to give us feedback on the scripts and quizzes, and we were able to modify the content based on their feedback. Uh, we also sought feedback from faculty partners in the courses that we were pilot that that were piloting the modules, um, and this was extremely helpful because in in our own disciplinary areas, we end up using in language a lot. Um, information literacy is one of those things that they don't often use that term out in industry, but they want those skills, 
right? They know they want the students to be able to do that, but we're using different language to talk about things. So this helped us make sure we weren't using jargon uh, in our scripts and also that we were covering all of the topics that would be most helpful to students. You know, I, I worked in business for 10 years, but that was a long time ago now. So I, I'm no longer a good source for what information skills these students need. So having that stakeholder feedback really improved the quality of what we were doing. Um, so we developed five modules, which are listed here, um, and along with their learning outcomes. Uh, and we knew we would pilot the modules in an engineering technology capstone course um, that our partner Fred teaches and a first year business management course, um, Management 110th that I mentioned earlier as part of our curriculum. Uh, that course is focused on information strategies for business students. We wanted the content to be available to any instructor on campus who wanted to use this content in their courses in a mix and match fashion. So some instructors use all of the modules, some use one or two. And the idea of these is that the modules are foundational. They don't go very deep into these areas, but they're designed to provide the best content for which instructors can then, um, with their own librarians or on their own, develop more complex discipline-specific lessons. Um, and again, this is, this is designed so that we don't have to go into these classrooms and do these things. We can provide this to all of campus um, to help supplement what we are able to do with our limited time. So this is packaged into, into a Brightspace, our LMS course, where students can self-enroll. Um, typically, instructors give students directions to enroll and on how to do it. Uh, it's a separate course in the system than the one that they are taking with their instructor. Um, the course contains badges for each module, um, which I'll talk more about in a moment, uh, but each, each module is no more than one hour of work uh, with the videos and the quizzes. When a student earns 100% on all of the quizzes and shows mastery, they are auto awarded a badge for that module. Um, and there's unlimited attempts for this. So here's a listing of the videos in the first module, which is focused on information gathering. Um, it's nine videos. Most are under four minutes. All are under four and a half minutes to fit within those parameters of micro learning. Um, and then I'm going to, I'll, I'll show you a bit more about some of these videos in depth here so you can see, see what we're doing as well um, and just kind of demo what, what we're doing. So activity one, the KWHLAQ framework. Um, this is something I've, I've used in my classes for years on how to break problems into pieces. So I'm going to switch over here. Nope, that was wrong. One moment. Switch to this so you all can watch this first video from our first module. When first approaching a problem, it can be extremely helpful to use a process to break it down into pieces and determine what your specific information needs might be. The KWH LAQ framework can help you think this through. Let's take each letter of the framework, starting with K, no. List out what you already know about the problem. This could be background information you already have, information you've learned on the job, things you learned in classes or from research, through conversation, reading, news, or the internet. It's easy to forget that we come into a problem or task with knowledge, regardless of how early in our careers we may be. Next, let's examine W, want. Think about what else you want to know. What specific problem are you trying to solve? What are the gaps in the information you have? What is missing? What information would help you solve this problem? For example, do you need sales data, logistics and supply chain information, company information, or something else entirely? What information will fill gaps and help you see the full picture? Next is H. How? Now that you've identified information gaps, how are you going to find that information? What strategies will you use? This could involve library, public, or human resources, among others. Think about the quality and accuracy of the information you need. 
What level of rigor is required for the question you are trying to answer? Where can you find this type of information? Then you move on to L, learned. After you've gathered your information, analysis is required to determine what you have learned. Does it make sense? Did you find the answer that will let you make a decision or answer the question? Or as sometimes happens, did you find another problem or information gap? Now you are ready to decide what A, action to take. Using what you have learned from the information gathered, what action will you take? Can you make a decision and solve the problem? What are you going to do? Finally, what Q questions do you have? After you make your decision and take action, what questions do you have? This is the time to reflect on your process and the outcome. Are there things that went well? Things you would do differently with hindsight? What were the impacts of your decision? The KWH LAQ process can help slow down your thinking and help you determine your information needs and course of action. Further videos in this series will help with the KWH pieces of the puzzle, but it is just as important to do the LAQ steps. Information is only turned into knowledge and intelligence through analysis and reflecting on our processes help us become better decision makers. All right, so that's our very first video that the students watch. And I'll give you an example here of the type of problem that they get in the quizzes. So, so we didn't want the quizzes to just be memorization. Um, and there were a few, few issues here. We couldn't, because we want this to be scalable, it can't be something that we are grading, right? So we need to build in some complexity within the confines of the automated quiz process. So to do that, um, we've gone with story problems. Um, as a solution in some of these cases. So in this case, our story problem, Ms. Patel, a recent Purdue graduate, was appointed as a project manager at a multinational automotive part manufacturing company, DHM Automotive, Autom automotive Incorporated, a business with a presence across 20 count countries. DHM Automotive Incorporated is an innovative and diversified supplier to the automotive and heavy vehicle aftermarket. Through using a well-integrated network of global partners, the company offers quality products at competitive prices with on-time delivery. A year after her appointment, Ms. Patel was called to the headquarters of the company located in New York, USA. There, the board recognized the work she had accomplished during the past year. Further, the chief executive officer informed Patel that she was being promoted to chief project manager for one year. She would continue her tenure after successfully initiating the business DHM Automotive Incorporated would like, like to expand into an emerging economy, India. The board also informed Ms. Patel that they would like to see results within the next 10 months. Moreover, they stated that a successful business expansion would be a dream opportunity for the company. Therefore, the project budget would not be a major component and she should focus rather on time of completion. So the question here is thinking through the scenario with the KWH LAQ framework, what does Ms. Patel already know? A, information regarding industry and market expansion learned through her degree program at Purdue. B, company information regarding previous projects and expansions. C, location and timeline for the expansion or D, all of the above, right? In this case, it's all of the above. She knows all of these things going into the project. Um, and then quiz question two, what other pieces of information might Ms. Patel want? Uh, who are the existing players in the market in India? What is the competitive landscape? What is the current manufacturing landscape across the country? What locations might make sense for a new factory? What is the manufacturing capability of DHM Automotive's current production facilities? How difficult is it to do business in India? What are the labor rates, environmental impact, and government regulations, or all of the above? In this case, it is obviously all of the above. She, she needs to know all of these things. Um, and I have one more here. Um, we talked a bit about the, the human pieces of information, and we wanted to build that into these modules as well. And one of the big factors is intercultural communication. Right. We we I mean, we're doing this right now. We're all from different cultures here. Um, but we have to consider this in a, in a business environment as well and in an information context. So 
I have one more video for you to watch and also to give my voice a little break here. Let's see. All right, so this is video nine in module one, considering intercultural communication. Have you ever considered what is culture? You may have taken or plan to take humanities or social science courses that focus deeply in this area. However, you may not have considered how culture applies to gathering information from others in your future workplace. So what is culture? According to the Dutch social scientist, Dr. Geert Hofstede, culture is the collective programming of the mind which distinguishes the member of one group or category of people from another. Using data collected from IBM, Hofstede initially identified four dimensions of national culture. First, power distance index. This describes how power is distributed among members of a group. In business cultures with a high degree of power distance, employees accept structures where everyone has a place in a hierarchy without the need for consensus. Alternatively, in low power distance cultures, employees at the lower ends of the hierarchy are routinely asked for their feedback. Second, collectivism versus individualism. Collectivist cultures value relationships, loyalty, and group well-being whereas individualistic cultures emphasize personal rights and achievements. Communication in individualistic cultures is more direct than in collectivist cultures. In collectivist cultures, the group reputation is more important than that of any individual. Third, uncertainty avoidance index. This focuses on how a group accepts uncertainty and ambiguity. Cultures with high uncertainty avoidance have strict policies and rules and tend to be less tolerant of change. In comparison, low uncertainty avoidance cultures have few rules and are comfortable with the unknown and change. And the fourth dimension, femininity versus masculinity, where Hofstede shares these definitions. In high masculine cultures, there are large gender wage gaps and few women in management positions. These four dimensions provide a foundation of culture for you to consider in gathering information from others in the workplace. The dimensions guide who you approach and how you approach them, as well as how to interpret the information that you gather. For example, if you're trying to gather information from workers at a manufacturing plant in a culture with a high degree of power distance, they may not be willing to share opinions that differ from their supervisors. Also, in some organizations, it may be commonplace to address supervisors and or instructors by their first names. However, for initial greetings, it's best to use a formal approach with a salutation such as dear or hello, and a title such as professor, Mr., Ms., doctor, followed by a last name. For example, using this approach, students emailing me would write, Dear Professor Phillips, for inclusivity purposes, it's best to use gender neutral language with initial greetings and avoid the use of Mr., Ms., Sir, or Madam. If you do not know their preferred pronouns or greetings, use dear first name, last name. For example, dear Margaret Phillips. Overall, it's best practice to ask people in initial greetings how they prefer to be addressed going forward. Many times, the geographic location of a company can give you some insight into its cultural dimensions. Researching information resources can help you prepare, such as databases and books on cross-cultural communication and business etiquette from the Purdue libraries. However, it's worth noting that every culture is unique. You may need to dive deeper in order to gain a solid understanding. You may need to find a mentor who is part of that culture or who has significant insights into that culture that you're going to be working with. All right, so that's the second video. Let me get back into my slides. Um, I do have, I'm gonna skip by these. I have the other questions here that we asked for this particular video, but basically we're asking about a scenario once again, and then which of those dimensions does the scenario relate to? Uh, and then 
what is the correct way to greet a person when you don't know anything about them other than their name is Taylor Johnson, right? And that is Dear Taylor Johnson. So moving ahead. Um, when we were creating this, the criteria that we were thinking about, we, we needed a platform for this and we explored several, several different ones. Um, and we ended up settling on our own LMS rather than a third party one for a number of reasons. One, we needed this thing to be scalable. We're trying once again to reach those 44,000 undergraduate students, 55,000 total students. We need it to be self-grading and self-enrolling. We can't be managing any aspect of this if we want it to be large. Uh, and we also wanted the badges to be exportable. Um, the students can export the badges they earn from this into either their Badger backpack, uh, I think it's called Canvas Badges now, it changed, changed names there, or directly to their LinkedIn. And then the other thing, we needed it to be no cost. Uh, we want this thing to be sustainable. So we can't have it um, be based solely on this grant funding that we got, or it will have a time span uh, at which it expires and we have to either seek new funding or sunset the project. So cost was a big deal as well. And with this embedded inside of our learning management system, um, the cost is already paid by the university. We will always have a learning management system. So I have a bit on here that I'm probably going to go through pretty quickly here because I want to talk about one more program and then have time for Q&A as well. Uh, but we were able to set these awards up inside of Brightspace, again, our, our learning management system, um, to export to Badger Backpack. Uh, we were able to set up the criteria for these awards. They, they have to get 100% on all of the module video quizzes in order for it to release that badge. And then we are also able to edit the award description. And this is what exports along with the badge icon into LinkedIn or where, wherever they want to export this. We write this language here so we can edit this, which is really nice. So we're, we're basically certifying that they've completed all of the content and it's about one hour of learning. These are the basic topics that were included in this badge. Um, and then we were able to use to create badge icons as well, specifically for for our badges. Um, and then to export the badges, it's very easy in our system. You just hit a little share thing once you earn it, uh, and it will export right into these two these two programs. Um, I did do some searching in other LMSs. Uh, Canvas, Moodle, and Blackboard also have. Um, badge capabilities as well, uh, which is important for our next steps. So, so far, our badge totals, we've been running this uh, since August of 2022. We've given out um, over 2,500 total badges, uh, I believe to over 1,100 students because we have students earning multiple badges. So that is 2,500 students going through content that we didn't have to be there in person to teach. Um, and these were just our pilot years. We're, we're now really um, working harder to roll this out more broadly. Um, we did collect some data on this. We got, we got some quantitative and some qualitative feedback to ask what the students think about, about it. Um, on the whole, they really like it. They like the modules. They see that they are applicable. Um, I'm going to again skim by this a little bit, but uh, we got some good quality or qualitative feedback on these as well. The students really seem to, to understand how this will be relevant to them in both academia and the workplace, um, which is something that we were very glad to see. Um, because once again, the evidence shows that if the students can see the relatability of content, they're much more likely to retain it. So what are our next steps? Well, in excellent recent news, we have some donor funding to expand this. Um, so we're going to be doing phase two. Uh, we will be improving the video quality. Uh, as you saw, the quality wasn't um, what it could be. Uh, and the reason for that, we have really nice video recording studios on Purdue's campus, uh, and they were down because of a hack um, when we were going to record these. So we did get very nice microphones and green screens for our offices uh, to record these, but the quality 
recording um, on a computer using Zoom is very different than the quality you can get in a professional setup. So part of what we're going to do is re-record our videos to be a higher content or higher quality. Uh, we also want to expand for additional content. This is also based on that research I mentioned earlier. Um, we want to add some AI uh, content. We want to add a data literacy module. Um, and we want to add privacy information as well, because again, that was the feedback that we got from, um, from the employers that they really wanted. And then the thing I'm most excited about, uh, the donors really want to support this being open files for librarians. And that's why it was so important that other LMS uh, learning management systems uh, support badging right, and support this type of thing. So we're going to be able to create a more generic, non-Purdue focused set of modules and make them an open educational resource that other librarians can download that file, import it into their local learning management system, and then they can use these courses as well uh, and they can give out badges to their students um, so that it's not just helping our local campus. It's hopefully going to help other librarians who are also struggling with the number of students that we really need to support. So very excited about that. We'll hopefully be doing that project next summer uh, and then we'll have those those files available the, the following year. So very excited to be working on that. Um, and then those are just some references from what I was mentioning. Um, and then the last program I want to talk about, I think I just have one slide on this, so it's going to be very quick, but this is another way that we are supporting information literacy instruction at scale at Purdue. So there's a program called IMPACT, and it stands for Instruction Matters Purdue Academic Course Transformation. Uh, I'm not sure how it is in your institution, but here, we love an acronym. Anything that we can turn into an acronym, we do. So we have the IMPACT program. This has been running for more than 10 years now. I think I think maybe 12 years it's been running. But it's a semester-long program. Um, there are weekly sessions to help faculty from across campus design courses in a way that focuses on student-centered learning. Um, and that also includes information literacy. A big component of this is, is helping every instructor who goes through this program integrate aspects of information literacy into their courses. So management and support teams for this program include faculty and staff from our campuses, Center for Instructional Excellence, um, our Purdue University online team, and then libraries and School of Information Studies. So every cohort has a few faculty members in it working on their courses, and then someone from each of these groups. So these faculty members are working directly with someone from libraries to help integrate information literacy into their courses. Um, 2011, I did put the date in here. So we, it started in 2011. Impact has worked with 575 instructors who's trans, who have transformed over 550 courses. Uh, and when they looked at the data last, over 90% of undergraduates take an impact course. So this is such a great way for us to truly reach more of those students um, that we otherwise wouldn't get to. So with that, I have talked for a long time uh, and I would be very happy to take any of your questions. Thank you.